Welcome back to the podcast, everybody. This is Steve, and today I'm joined not by my normal partner, Jason, but by Buck Holler uh, with the Searcy Institute and a local school here in my hometown. Uh, Buck and I have known each other for quite some time, and one of the reasons I love Buck is because he doesn't come with a poem in tow like Jason tends to do. So uh, you get a little vacation listening to the podcast today from poetry. Instead, we're going to we're going to send a little Latin your way here, at least towards the end of our podcast. So, Buck, welcome. Uh, Could you start off by telling us just a little bit about who you are and what you're doing in education generally? Sure. Thanks. Well, Buck Holler, uh, as you introduced me, but uh, I mean, I'm originally from California and and I grew up rodeoing and working with uh, horses a lot. And my first career basically was training horses. But uh, I got into education. I went through grad school, studied theology and languages, and uh, primarily biblical languages, and uh, landed in um, a career of teaching, uh, ultimately in New York City, which was strange of all places. But when I got into New York City, I discovered I found myself in a classical school. Uh, There I was teaching at the Geneva School of Manhattan. and when I landed there and I discovered this thing, I had no idea what classical Christian education was. And uh, of course I was interested and I started picking up everything I could on the topic and reading it. And ultimately the first book that I came across was a little pamphlet done by Chris Perrin who runs classical academic press. And it was a pamphlet titled something like an introduction to, for a parent's guide to classical education or something like that. And in the back of that book was an appendix, <clears throat> was an appendix, and I, it was a list of resources. And I just started going through all of those resources, and those resources eventually led me to another book, which was called "Classical Education: A Movement Sweeping Across America," which was authored by Andrew Kern. And again, at the time, I had no idea who it was, and I started going through that and found the website in the back of that book called the Searcy Institute. And when I started scouring the pages of the Searcy Institute, I discovered something called the apprenticeship. And that was, for me, the big question, because at the time, for me, there were two questions. One, what is Christian classical education? And the second question was, how do I do it? If, and I felt like understanding Christian classical education was an easy enough task. I mean, I say that, but that seems to be like the perennial question, what is classical education? But I thought I could read enough literature and get a grasp on that. But for me, the bigger task was how do I do it? How do I teach classically? And when I was looking at the apprenticeship, this is back around 2006, um, that was what they were proclaiming. They said that the, the purpose of the apprenticeship was to teach people how to teach classically. And so I signed up and uh, I joined the apprenticeship. It was a three-year. It, it is a three-year program. At that time, there was just one apprenticeship. Andrew Kern was leading it, and I graduated from it in 2009, I believe, or 2010, with two other individuals. And uh, it, that's kind of from there. It's history. Well, and that that history has expanded. How many apprenticeships are on the Searcy map these days? Right. So. Yeah. So when I finished the apprenticeship, I stayed on with Cersei. And while I was in the apprenticeship, I came down to my moved my family to North Carolina here to Winterville and started teaching at the school here. And when I finished the apprenticeship, Andrew asked me to stay on and help in some projects. So the projects were running the, the apprenticeship and also dealing with um, lost tools of writing. We were coming out with our fourth edition at the time. And uh, we, at that time, launched the online academy. And so I was behind each one of those three uh, uh, programs. But it got to be too much for me at the time. And so I started backing out of them and and having other people come in. That's when Brian um, came in to do the online academy. And uh, Matt uh, Bianco came in with Lost Tools. And at the time, Leah Lutz was doing the apprenticeship. And at that time, we had just launched. Uh, a second apprenticeship in Houston, Texas, uh, led by Renee Mathis. And um, and Leah Lutz was running an apprenticeship in California. So 
back around 2012 or so, we had three apprenticeships and it stayed that way. So we had one in California, one in Texas, and the, the first one here in North Carolina. But um, a few years ago, the current director, Kathy Rape, at that time of the apprenticeship was asking me if I'd be willing to start a second apprenticeship here in North Carolina. And so I finally did, took it, and we, we launched it. And so we have two apprenticeships now in North Carolina. Last year, we launched a couple more, and we are the year before last. And this year, we've launched another couple. So we, we, have, we have one in California, one in Texas, two here. No, we have three here. Sorry. We have three apprenticeships here in North Carolina now, one in the mid-Atlantic states, um, led by Christine Meridian in uh, like Delaware, Maryland area. I think she's actually in Pennsylvania and then another apprenticeship in Ohio. So what's that? One, two, five, six, seven apprenticeships. And this is exactly sort of the uh, vision that Andrew had of, uh, well, like the apostles, right? That, that by starting with a few, it would multiply. And so it's, I, I wouldn't call it exponential yet, but it's grown fairly rapidly with more and more people being affected by it. Uh, just in brief, tell me a little bit about w- what an apprenticeship experience is like. What do you what do you do to apprentice? Because you're talking about people that are spread out geographically, uh, quite some distance. They're not they're not meeting weekly or anything, are they? Right. So, yeah, I could uh, go into quite a bit of detail, but I'll keep it short. The, the basically the apprenticeship is a three year commitment, and what we do is we meet. For a week, we have a week-long seminar in the summer and then again in the winter. So we have two of those. And that's an intense seminar. So it goes on for a full week, about eight hours a day, eight, nine, sometimes 10 hours a day for a full week. And then we meet monthly um, in between the two retreats, the one in August and the one in February. Um, During our meetings, our monthly webinars, our monthly meetings, we focus on three basic things, writing, teaching, and reading. So we have a canon of literature uh, that works on a three-year cycle. So every year, the apprentices are reading a classic text, either by Homer or Virgil. So the three years, we read the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and the Aeneid. And we'll read a complementary text out of one of Plato's dialogues, the, the Mino, the Phaedrus, and the Gorgias. And then we also read a Shakespearean text. And so those are our fundamental uh, texts that we read. And then there are some other texts that we read. We read uh, Wendell Berry's Standing by Words. We read Aristotle's Rhetoric, uh, Scott Crider's Office of Assertion, Dante's um, Divine Comedy. So there's a lot of, there's a few other books that are woven into it. And so those, uh, those readings and the discussion of those readings uh, constitute some of the, the one of the monthly meetings, but we also have something in the apprenticeship called a you know each of the apprentices after their first year become a mentor, and those mentors men um, serve as serve as mentors of new apprentices mentees. So every every new apprentice is assigned a mentor, and so part of their monthly meetings is that the mentors meet with their mentees to discuss everything pertaining to the, the apprenticeship, classical education, the modes of classical instruction, which we teach in the apprenticeship, the mimetic mode of instruction and the Socratic, um, and the, the literature and the writing of essays. So one of the things all the apprentices have to do is they have to teach lost, lost tools in some capacity, and they also spend time writing essays from the readings that we do. All right. Well, so it sounds to me like uh, it would be best for somebody who's actively teaching, but this would work for homeschool folks, people in traditional school settings, uh, I guess, at least theoretically, somebody that isn't even teaching but wanted to get into uh, uh, better communication skills, reading and writing and speaking, that would still be helpful to them. Yeah, we have... I have all kinds of folks. I've got homeschool parent moms. Uh, I've had a homeschool dad. I've had college um, professors come in. Um, 
I have people who are teaching in schools, head of schools. Um, we've got the whole gambit of, of different p- people in some capacity involved in education. All right. Now, you took a turn here recently and all the apprenticeship, even though you're reading Greek and Roman and Italian works, you're reading them in English. But I've known you and, and, and watched you take this dive into, first of all, uh, taking on the, the Latin instruction at your school without knowing, did, did you know any Latin prior to, to starting to teach it? Uh, no. I mean, you'd had Greek and Hebrew in, in, in your master's work, but um, you, you taught yourself Latin so that you could teach it to others. Right. Uh, mostly middle schoolers or in high schoolers, I think. As seventh grade. Yeah. That's when I came. Yeah. Yeah. And um, at some point, t- tell us a little bit about it, your experience, first of all, with immersive Latin or uh, I may be using the wrong term, but 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 you you jumped into this deep pool uh, in Kentucky, I think. It was, and then, then you've been to Italy several times. Tell us about that experience and then how that's led to, to what you're doing for Circe now. Uh, do an apprenticeship in the Latin language instead of in English. Right. So when I took the job in North Carolina, I, I mainly took it. They were looking for a humanities teacher, and but they also needed a Latin teacher and asked if I could do it. And I thought I was confident enough to say, yes, I could. But you're right. I didn't. I had no exposure to Latin prior to that. So I picked up a copy of Wheelock's Latin that summer <laughs> and, studied, and studied it. I figured I knew enough grammar uh, from my other language studies that I could, it was just a matter of learning vocabulary. And um, for that first year, I was probably about a day ahead of my students uh, working through the text. But that was uh, 11 years ago now. And I, from there, it's expanded. And I, I've grown to, to really love Latin. It's a phenomenal language. And, uh, it's the only language I've actually taken to a a level that I think that I have some small, uh, sense of mastery of, um, to where I feel comfortable enough with it that I can actually read the literature and enjoy it without, um, having to labor for hours over a page of text trying to translate. And, um, so that journey you mentioned started, Several years ago, actually with Andrew Kern, we were, um, Andrew and I have always been talking, have always talked about Latin. And he pointed me at one point, at one time to a, uh, a, a YouTube video. And I think he had discovered the program, the, the classics program at the University of Kentucky. And so I started looking those things up. And from there, I just started diving into it and discovered that there was a whole world out there that was growing really small at the time. This was probably, I don't know, seven, eight years ago at the time. It seems small at the time. Um, that were people who were attempting to teach Latin using Latin. And um, that was really appealing to me uh, for a couple of reasons. One of the main ones, I had already been somewhat exposed to that with Hebrew in my college days, because my professor was um, friends with a gentleman named Randall Booth, who runs a program called Living Biblical Hebrew out of Tel Aviv, Israel. And when I was in college about 20 years ago, he had a beta program on learning biblical Hebrew using biblical Hebrew. And we were sort of using that as a beta program at the time. And and I had some experience with that and, and had talked with Randall Booth a little bit and had uh, been inspired about learning languages standing within the language rather than looking at the language from outside. And um, so I started exploring that, and eventually I went to Dickinson College. So the University of Kentucky, Terrence Tunberg, had started this, I believe, in 1996. I think he's been doing it for over 20 years. And I think he was the first to start it in the States. And he does two programs in the summer. He does one week-long seminar in Lexington, and then he does another one at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And so I started going to the one in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I went two or three, I think two or three times I went. And then I ran into some other people 
online through YouTube, um, a gentleman who was teaching um, Latin from Italy, and we started corresponding. I invited him to come to the States. He came to our school and did a uh, week long, uh, or actually it was two weeks, two weeks uh, seminar here. And he was a former teacher and graduate of the Academia Vivarium Novum in Italy, in Rome. And so I got into that and, and went to that a few years ago with Jason, actually, and a couple of our students had gone as well. And that was an eight month excursion where we were immersed um, learning the language for eight weeks. Did I say eight months? I'm sorry, two months, eight weeks uh, in Rome during the summer. And that was a pretty phenomenal experience. Not easy. It was very hard. And I don't think I'll do that again. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a long time to be away from home. And so I started transitioning my program at that time. I started slowly transitioning my teaching from a grammar translation approach to something that was what I like to say is using the an, a, teaching Latin actively. So meaning that I, I use the, all four faculties, language faculties of the student in order to teach the language. And it was a gradual transition, but I eventually made the full transition to where that's the way we teach. That's the way I teach at the school in my courses is I teach it in the language. And, um, and there, that, that raises a lot of questions like why I do it and, and so forth, which I'm happy to answer. But, um, but draw it to a close to your, your initial question. That, that experience of, and love of teaching Latin, and Andrew and I had been talking about in, in terms of the apprenticeship and just learning Latin, I sort of put two and two together. And knowing the, the value of the apprenticeship, which I, I really, the apprenticeship is probably one of the best educational experiences I've ever had, one both as a student and as a teacher. It's just a phenomenal program that's very unique. And I thought, okay, is there a way to take that idea and do Latin at the same time? Because we're always talking about the importance of Latin, especially in reading classical, the classical authors. And instead of talking about it all the time, let's do it. And so what I wanted to do was merge those two ideas and create a, a apprenticeship program that was focused purely on teaching Latin so that at the end of which people can be confident and fluent enough in their studies of Latin that they could continue it from that point on. Good. Well, so you've, you've got, I think mostly by word of mouth, a full first year Latin apprenticeship up and running. Uh, I, I assume it's going well. Yep. Uh, you and I haven't talked about it in a while, but um, I, I'm of course fascinated. Um, I don't, I don't know any Latin. That's painfully obvious anytime I try and speak it to someone. Um, but uh, I, I see the necessity at a number of levels for why we want Latin to continue in good education. Um, very few of which are what I would call practical reasons. Most of them are quite. Um, liberal reasons. Um, uh, talk to me just a little bit. Well, I guess I have a two-part question. What What is this kind of a, and I keep wanting to refer to it as immersionist, or, or what, what is a classroom that's taught from within the language practically look like? What's the experience like for the student? And then, and then justify it. Why is it, in your mind, better than the grammar translation model that's probably the, the, the majority of what you would find in a Latin class today? Yeah, and I'll just kind of work back a little bit quickly and then go back forward. I At one time, I might have said better. I don't know if I'm so comfortable with saying that. I, I, I am very comfortable saying that's different. And, and I think that there is a place or a rationale for teaching a grammar translation approach. And there are three... Historically, there are, there are three reasons for learning a language, literary, scholarly, and social. And there's a whole tradition, a historical tradition of teaching languages that 
depending on which one of those three areas of language learning, I think there's an appropriate model of instruction associated with that goal. So if the goal was social to learn a language, then it that makes less sense to focus purely on grammar and translation than it does to to learn the language by means of using it, by hearing it, by speaking it, by reading it, writing it. By Those are the four language faculties I was referring to earlier, reading, writing, speaking, listening. Um, but if your goal is aim is scholarly, then it makes perfect sense to use a grammar translation approach to, to learn the the syntactical structures and fundamental grammar of a language um, because it's going to serve a purpose for which you're studying the language. Um, so there's, it just, just kind of depends, like why are you studying a language and, and what, what mode of instruction is most fitting to that purpose? So that's kind of how I look at it now. Um, and, but I, I do, I use something that's called, some people call it the direct me- method. Um, that's kind of what it was historically known as. It originated in some sense out of the 19th century. Um, w. H. D. Rouse was one of the first uh, proponents of it then. However, it, it, that's what it was sort of called at the time. Though teaching the language by means of the language goes all the way back to the classical period, and so there's there's a full-on historical trajectory in line of of um, a a consistent line of teaching the language in this way. And in fact, it's only after the enlightenment that late mid 18th century going into the 19th and 20th centuries that the, the scholarly languages, Latin and Greek became focused and taught purely from a grammar approach, grammar translation approach. That's more of a modern um, uh, form of teaching as opposed to a, a more classical form or historic form. So in my classroom, what it looks like is um, we have a text. We use a, a book by Hans Ordberg called Lingua Latina. Um, there's, it's written, there are two books, Familia Romana and Roma Eterna. And the students in the school, if they continue with their Latin up into the high school and complete the required credits, they'll get through the first book and they might get into the second book a little bit. If they want to continue their Latin into their junior and fresh, uh, senior year, we'll get further into more actual Latin texts. Like I have a group of students right now, we're reading Caesar and Virgil this year. But, um, but the students come in and, and basically I, I teach it. I try to use, you know, what we've learned in the apprenticeship, mimetic instruction, the mimetic mode of instruction, and which I'll say basically is teaching a single idea by means of types. And the point is, is you want the student to be able to see the idea by looking first at the types because an idea is abstract and which is a very hard thing to see. But we first, when we learn something, we first learn something by seeing it through our senses, by means of our senses. And so we need to be able to see something. We need to be able to hear something. We need to be able to touch smell right we need to be able to to uh engage the idea by means of our senses and so we use types we use sometimes you might say example and by means of those types you the student slowly and gradually begins to see what the idea is and the goal is for the student to move from perception to imitation and recreation. So the student begins to imitate the idea, but ultimately you want the student to be able to represent the idea themselves by having having fully grasped it. And so I try to use the same techniques in a Latin class. And so what I do is um, I, I will introduce vocabulary. I focus on vocabulary, grammar, and comprehension. And those are my three fundamental concepts that I, I focus on. And I'll introduce students into vocabulary. If I have objects to demonstrate it, sometimes it's easy in a classroom. You know, there's some things in the classroom that you can you can grab a hold of, like a, a door or a desk or a window or a pencil or a whiteboard or students or clothing or backpacks. And there's a lot of these things that you can use. 
Um, but there's also actions. And so in, in the book, when we read, there's some things that happen, like it says that the, the boy, the brother hits his sister. And so it's kind of easy to get two students up to demonstrate a student, you know, hitting another or I, me not actually hitting them, but simulating it, but only using the language. And the point is this, is that you want the student to be able to, and this is actually an idea that goes all the way back to Augustine. You want the student to be able to associate what they're seeing or what they're hearing with the words. So if I say puer puelam pusat, right, and I have a, a male student pretending like he's, you know, hitting a, a female student maybe in the arm or something, without saying English, and I can point to the boy and say puer. And then I point to the girl, Puelam, and then I have the boy simulate a, you know, a a tap or, you know, a hit on the shoulder and say, Pulsat. It's not required that I have to say, oh, the boy hit the girl. I don't need to do that. And I don't want to have to do that because that's actually going the long way around to the concept. I can get directly to the concept by associating the words demonstrated by the action or the picture to the concept directly. I don't have to go around another language in order to get to it. And that's a really hard habit to break with the students. But the point of that and the purpose of it in doing that is to get them to a point to where they can begin to think in the language and to begin to understand by means of the language. And that's my ultimate goal is to get a student to be able to understand what they're reading, what they're hearing in the language itself without having to use a second language to superimpose it upon it in order to make sense of it. It doesn't need English to make sense. It makes sense in and of itself, but we just have to be able to see the connections. Yeah, I see that a lot with my ESL students, uh, most of whom think in Spanish and they have to everything that's said and done in class. They then have to go through the long process of of translating it so that they can think about it. They're not capable of thinking in English. They think in Spanish, and we're conducting class in English. And so this is a very, especially when I start asking them to write or ask them to do public speaking. It's it's very much like working through a translator. They're they're their own translator, and it's very cumbersome. And, and makes them struggle a great deal in, a, in an English speaking class. So I see the benefit of trying to teach a language as the language, not as a translated language. That's a, I might have gotten much more excited about Greek in college uh, had it been taught that way than, than the amazing amount of uh, angst it engendered in me when I was mainly fumbling about with, with grammatical things. Um, well, I, I, Appreciate it. Of course, fascinated and would love to 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 turn over the last two hours of the program to you telling us funny stories about Jason uh, going through a program <laughs> like this in Rome. But he's the editor of these podcasts, so he would he would cut all that out anyway. And it as would be as long as we talked about uh, tree folk. That's uh... <laughs> yeah. Now I know I know the reference there. These clowns <laughs> go from America to Italy and adopt as their favorite restaurant in Rome an Irish pub. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it was an oasis. It was, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that to be uh, self-revealing as to what it means. But um, I do appreciate your time and appreciate your explanation. I hope folks uh, on, on the on the website, I'm going to try and put some of the resources that Buck's mentioned so that you can kind of check this out yourself. But I, I'd really come away from this interview with, with, with two suggestions for you. One, don't shy away from languages that you don't know yet. Um, I, I, I believe people of, of quite modest intelligence, such as Buck, no, <laughs> sorry, uh, uh, just about anybody with the desire to do so, uh, this is kind of what Buck was saying earlier. When you know why you want to learn the language, I think it's possible to learn it. Uh, if you're just being compelled to learn it for a diploma or something like that, it's quite another experience. But when you want to know it, 
uh, whether it is to teach it to someone else or, or, or just to have access to that language for yourself. Uh, and, and keeping in mind Latin in particular, I could defend because most of what we have in Western civilization at some point or another was either written in Latin originally or has, has come through translation work. So if you, if you wish to dig into the past and what we have as a culture, uh, you know, if, if you were armed with Latin and, and classical Greek, you would find yourself much better suited than somebody who's like myself, limited to English translations. It's just, you know, my, my friends who know Homer in the original or are able to, to dig into Dante in Italian. I teach Dante every year, but I, I only have familiarity with it through the English and it's, there's limits that I'm not, I'm not set free to enjoy it in its fullness because it wasn't written originally in English. And so I'm kind of bound to my translator. Uh, so, so don't shy away from language and check out the notion of apprenticeship. Um, I am weary of the notion that if you go off and take a few classes, uh, it will prepare you for anything more than the science of teaching. You can learn vocabulary. You can learn some basic quote unquote techniques as techniques in a book, uh, but teaching is an art and it is best learned by close association with some teacher that's better than yourself. Um, you're also helped if you associate yourself a few years into teaching with someone who's less accomplished than you. It, it goes both ways. But the mentor-mentee mentality that is that is alive and well in the Searcy apprenticeship, and it's the only one I know of, so it's the only one I push, um, is is refreshing. As Buck said, it's, it's, it's one of the best ways to learn something is to learn it from someone who loves it themselves and to learn by doing and learn through being in the midst rather than uh, sitting in a class somewhere for a few weeks and, and coming out having graduated a teacher. Um, it's, it's much more intensive, of course, but the, the benefits are, are huge and can't be dis discounted. So thanks again to Buck. Appreciate your time and I uh, hope the listeners will ask us lots of questions. We always welcome questions. And we know you ask the right questions. We might feel like Buck's the right man to come back and answer them for you. So um, until next time, thanks for listening to the Back Porch Education Podcast.